Welcome back, everyone. Hope you are having lots of fun today. Awesome. So before we get started with our great panel on maker to market space, let me make a very quick announcement. We have great stuff right after this as well. So stick around. <laughs> we'll have some great giveaways, happy hours, hang out with our community, and of course, learn with all this great DevNet Create session that we have put together. So welcome back here. So let me start with a very quick question. How many of you have been to Maker Fair before? Any hands? <laughs> awesome. Not yes. <laughs> Not enough. Yes. <laughs> so let me mm. say one thing. Last three days, last weekend, I spent time at Maker Fair, which I have been doing for last five years or so now. And some of the most amazing creativity that's coming out of this maker ecosystem is what just keeps me going back at that place. So if you have not been to Maker Fair, make sure to keep a point next time. Mark your calendars. I'm going to introduce to panel now. And this weekend, one of the greatest things. So Sherry is the co-creator and VP marketing of Maker Fair. So really Sherry, why don't you take a minute to sure. talk about the... Sure. Well, I see there's lots of opportunities since I didn't see enough hands going up um, <laughs> uh, about Maker Fair. But just to let you know, Maker Fair started as um, a festival to celebrate makers. And how about how many of you know about Make Magazine? Maybe we start there. Okay, a little bit better. Um, <laughs> how about O'Reilly Media? There we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, that's good. So we grew out of a division of, of O'Reilly Media. And why I think that's important is because we share a lot of that same DNA and the same values. So open source, sharing, collaboration. If you take something, you give something back. And that's the spirit of Maker Faire. So Dale Doherty, who started Make Magazine back in 2005 with um, Mark Fraunfelder, and you might know him from Boing Boing. Uh, mm -hmm. But Mark's actually kind of got his finger on the pulse of lots of things making. And I think now Mark's at Institute for the Future. But Make was really a, mag a magazine that was started primarily for folks that wanted to create things. And Dale realized that um, when he went back and looked like the old pop sci pop mechanics from the 30s, 40s, 50s were really like build a hovercraft in your basement or you know, do some aerial you know, something. So what Dale did was created Make. The tagline was technology on your time. And it was for primarily like engineers who got into engineering because they wanted to make things, but at work they were managing people projects budgets, not making things. So on the weekend, they started doing that. Well, Maker Faire, we started in 2006. It was Earth Day weekend. We had no clue what we were doing. We felt that we would pull together the makers. We launched in San Mateo at the event center. We only took part of the space. But I think what was so brilliant about what we did is that we created and pulled together lots of different communities. I think we were really social networking before social networking. Yeah. So we got something that was very cool um, called swap -a rama that mm -hmm. was fashioning technology. So um, pick a piece of clothing, sit down with a designer, okay. get online and start working. We pulled in um, what a large scale art from Burning Man. We definitely helped launch the Arduino folks. That was yes. 10 years ago. And anyway, fast forward, because um, I don't want to take the whole time, I'm sure I could, but <laughs> fast forward, 12 years later, we have 191 maker fairs around the world. We do it through licensing. This last year, uh, in 2016, we had 1.4 million attendees, but since we started, over 5 million attendees. But one thing about making that's very great is that it's, um, you know, it's multi-generational, it's multicultural, and um, one of the makers told me this weekend, too, age doesn't matter at all. So, with that said, that's a little bit about Maker Faire. We can talk more about it, but it really is um, a major part of the ecosystem. It's something that translates around the world, and we're hoping that we can get you all a little bit more engaged. So, talking about makers, <laughs> Zach, you are a maker yourself. I am. And tell us a little bit more how you took your maker to real enterprise or what Particle I.O. does now? Sure. Um, so uh, I run a company called Particle, and Particle is an Internet of Things device platform. So we help uh, companies and people who are creating some kind of physical product that's connected to the Internet. Um, we provide the tech stack um, to, uh, to support that product that ranges from the actual connectivity hardware that goes inside that device. Mm -hmm. um, 
to the cloud platform the device connects to and the SDKs you use to build the apps. It's all sort of built into the platform. Um, and I am a maker. I, I started, uh, I still have a video, actually, my first uh, um, Arduino in January 2012, the first time I like made an LED blink. Um, and that was cool. <laughs> um, and then basically, you know, uh, we ended up in a really interesting place where we launched a um, development kit on Kickstarter for building IoT prototypes in mid-2013. Um, it's called the Spark Core. Um, and uh, since then, we now have the largest community of engineers in the industry. We have 100,000 people building products with Particle. And what, we're, what we've discovered is there's this really interesting overlap between makers and um, professionals, which is that a very large percentage of people who um, call themselves makers also work as professional engineers and use those skills in a professional environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, you know, a lot of um, uh, our, our focus is making it as easy as possible to build an IoT prototype, and then if you intend to scale that prototype, if that's something that you want to deliver to market in large volume, and you need, and then you need to start thinking about like, how is this manufacturable? How is um, what's my security solution? Um, how am I going to uh, you know make this work reliably at 500,000 devices? Um, uh, we can provide that software platform. So we look a lot like, you know, we operate in some of the ways that a company like Twilio or Stripe does, where they're sort of providing a software platform that people use for app development, and then you, you use that to run your product later on, um, but, it, but in, a, in a unique way that's specific for IoT. Absolutely. And one of the things I think, Sherry, last year at the Maker card you had said, mm -hmm. uh, making is about tapping into your human powers and creativity, mm -hmm. but it's about sharing is what fuels the maker movement. So from sharing perspective, I know Alex, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Hackster is doing great work to bring this community of makers who are sharing their projects, driving inspiration. So tell us a little bit more about Hackster. For sure. So um, speaking of different communities, first off, Hackster is a place to learn hardware by sharing and exploring other people's projects uh, and your own. So each project that gets shared, we try to make sure that it has code, schematics, bill of materials, 3D models, anything that you would need in order to replicate that project. Um, and so in terms of communities, uh, one of the big things that we do is we have these hubs for each platform. Particle is one of the first and also the biggest platform on Hackster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they have an incredible active community. And um, so I think that's, that's the thing that we're most concerned about is A, growing each community on its mm -hmm. own. Um, so for example, we host Arduino projects. The Arduino like project site is based on Hackster. Um, and make that embeddable, but also connect the communities together. Because when you see a project that's built with Particle or Arduino or whatever, it also may be built with Amazon Alexa or Microsoft's IoT kit and things like that. And um, you're able to sort of follow the links and explore how to connect different stuff together uh, and thereby like join the different communities and stuff. One other big focus that we have is, um, besides democratizing hardware, one big part of that is bringing it off the internet into real life. Because what's the point of hardware if you only look at it on a screen, right? So <laughs> we have um, a network of about 100 different meetups in cities across the globe, from Mexico to New Zealand to the Netherlands and England and all these other places. South Africa, I think, has one. I might be wrong. <laughs> I haven't checked the list in a while. But uh, we have all these awesome ambassadors that get these monthly kits, and we work with uh, platforms to develop workshops for them so that people can get this hardware where they otherwise might not be able to afford it or may not just be in a place that has great access to it. Yeah, um, yeah and besides that, we run contests to help encourage people to build that thing that's been in their head forever, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, bringing people from that very beginning step to the pro level if they choose to go that route is a big focus of ours, so making it easy to connect them with the resources that they need to you know, turn their project into a Kickstarter or whatever. Yep. Uh, that whole journey we're really excited about. And that's where Hex comes into I play. think he specifically ordered <laughs> us exactly <laughs> for this reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, my reason was <laughs> slightly <laughs> different just to make Zach sit between all of us. <laughs> 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 Gotta make him feel surrounded. I've never been on a tech <laughs> battle before. I'm the only guy and I think it's amazing. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> 
And the oh, panel. Oh, the great women in tech here. And incredible. the panel is not called women in hardware. <laughs> it's not right. called women in hardware. Right. <laughs> okay, talk a little bit more about hacks yeah. because you guys are the expert to bring hardware makers to market. Yes, exactly right. So I am the non-engineer, maybe, of this, at least a yeah. few of us here. Um, uh, who here has heard of hacks before, as opposed to hackster hacks? So H A X. Okay, great. So I'll explain it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so Hacks is the world's largest and first hardware accelerator. So we run accelerators in two places in the world. The first one, the original Hacks, is in Shenzhen, China. So the center of manufacturing for electronics, um, the beginning of it all for a lot of makers in terms yeah. of the components they'll use and some of the yeah. resources they'll use. Um, Zach and Particle actually went through the Hacks program in Shenzhen, China four years ago now. Um, is that right, four years? Yeah, God, it's been a long time. So you were an <laughs> alumni of one of our programs and one of our um, best alumni in terms of examples of where we would love our companies to go. Um, so our program in Shenzhen works with about 50 teams per year, year who are looking to launch a hardware product. So if someone has a great idea and a proof of concept and a strong team and defensible technology that we think could in some way be novel, we want to invest with in that team and work with that team. And we do make them move to China for four months. So that's the catch. And obviously that's why um, those teams can move so quickly. Uh, we realized about two years ago that um, it was great to be producing all of these incredible alumni teams who were doing amazing things, but how do those teams then go to market? So once they have those products finally baked, or at least half-baked, how do they start selling it? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the end game for a lot of what we're all working on, or at least yep. in some cases for professional developers, for startups Absolutely. who have investment. Um, and that's where our San Francisco office comes in. So I run our program in San Francisco. My role before this was running the IoT team on behalf of Target Corporation. So I've worked with hundreds of startups with hardware tech products at this point. Um, and we help both B2C and B2B teams find customers, growth hack and market, create great sales pitches, work on their operations, in some cases manufacturing, um, and everything from team structure to founders agreements to legal help. Yeah. So we help teams that are typically about two and a half to three and a half years old, um, generally just pre-revenue, um, and we are lucky enough to actually have Zach as a mentor, which has been a huge pleasure for us. He's got some great advice on taking mm -hmm. a maker product to enterprise sales Ooh. at scale, sales. which is great. Um, and we are backed by SOSV, which is the third largest seed investor in the world, with over um, 430 teams that we've invested in across our various accelerators, which are hacks, IndieBio, and China Accelerator, if any of those names are familiar. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's a little bit about hacks. So now as we are hearing so much about this maker ecosystem, there's always this question, who is a maker? Am I a maker? Uh, is a professional a maker? So who is a maker? And let me maybe throw it out to you, Sherry, like sure. uh, what sure. do you think, who is a maker today? You know, anyone's a maker, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Uh, Dale Doherty, who's the founder of, um, of Make, actually mm. came up with the term primarily because he wanted it to be accessible. So if you're passionate about something, if you're tinkering, if you're, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be degreed to do it. You just need to do it. And you mm -hmm. need to be part of the community and you need to share. But you could be, you know, the Bob and Lace Makers Guild. You could be the Lego Users Group. You could be the Rocket Club. You could be the Food Maker. It doesn't matter. It's just that you have a passion and a spirit and um, that makes it completely open and accessible. And so hopefully all of you will take that path and also bring up, we, we, the other thing that's really important too, and we talked a little bit about it um, at Maker Fair is that a lot of kids are actually really getting turned on to making. And uh, I think that that's like our mission is to make more makers and it's really great to do it with kids. It's actually how we met um, Shiba with her young son who's got a little CEO of his own business. <laughs> Um, but that's okay because that's where they're starting and kids aren't afraid to make mistakes. They're really open to learning and therefore again They're like our perfect candidate for makers, but That's my take and I heard that uh, Conan O'Brien was at the <laughs> maker fair last weekend right. and his 10 year old yep, brought his, him ten year, his 10 year old son brought him they they get make magazine at home and it's and actually just true to like to pop sci, the old pop sci pop mechanics. Yep. It was one of those things that bridged the generations. So grandparents, parents, kids, all would read it and then talk about projects and start working on it. And so I find that kind of an interesting um, fact that actually even in the age of online and social, that there's still physical things that are actually pulling people together. Yes. And that's important. So as we talk about makers, another thing mm -hmm. I remember from the Maker Fair weekend, this. Right. Uh, 
Adam Savage from Mythbusters was there. <laughs> That's right. And one of the things he said, like, the making is the new term for the oldest thing, and I really love that term because that is so true. So as we talk about, like, so you are all professional tech workers. You are here to learn more about your areas, whether it's cloud, IoT. What it means for professionals like working on IoT today or working on your projects. So maybe, Alex, you have any take or anyone else in the panel who for have sure. a take on this? Yeah, so uh, about 60% of the people on Hexer are actually software yeah. professionals who are looking to get into hardware just because they're excited about it. And it's true, I think, that you work for a certain amount of time on a computer and you get antsy to do something with your hands as well, uh, or to connect the things that you're writing on the screen to turn that into magic in the real world. And that's totally, I understand that completely. Um, and I think that's part of the fire that drives people. Like you were saying, uh, you go for the teams more than the product. It's not about what you're making. Like the first thing that you make is going to be a blinky LED or a smart coffee machine or a baby monitor or a weather station or any of these, you know, we see the same projects over and over again. But that's awesome because that's how you start out. That's how you apply the skills you already know to grow. And um, yeah. Oh, I had something else there, but I've totally <laughs> lost it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason why we all who are like spending our time as a hobbyist should be thinking about what it means for our future and the impact it's bringing to the market, right? Really talking about the impact from how IoT is going to change the things around us. And I know there were great panel sessions today and other uh, speaking workshops that you attended, but a little bit going back to the journey of a maker, from starting in the garage, right. getting to an enterprise business with Zach. We have seen mm -hmm. you <laughs> do that. So any advice you will have for the makers and the hobbyists in our keynote session here today? So I think that um, you know, building a, a business, um, so really I think that, there, okay, we are, we're used to this image of, of a pair of entrepreneurs in a garage starting a business, right? Like that's, that's Everybody's seen that uh, that television show or that uh, um, <laughs> that movie, right? And many people have lived that life. Um, and what's interesting about that is two people really can, especially these days, the, as the more the technology gets easier and easier to use, the more it is really feasible for two people to build an mm -hmm. entire company. Um, and I think like when Instagram got bought by Facebook, there were like 11 people 11 or something people. like that, right? It's, yeah. it's sort of, that's actually possible. Yes. So what's interesting when you apply, when you bring hardware into the mix um, is, uh, there are a lot more uh, barriers in, in terms of actually like manufacturing a physical product. Um, you can't just do it with two people. You can do it with two people who like leverage a community of partners and contract manufacturers and things of that nature. Um, but the experience of it is very similar, right? Like two people in a garage can build a prototype of, of, a, of a physical product or an IoT product. Mm -hmm. And those two people are using the tools that um, are in, in, in most cases are using the same tools that um, people use for hobby projects, right? So if you're, if you're building an internet-connected cat feeder, the technology needs are very similar to if you're actually building a product that you intend to, that you intend to scale. There are a lot of cat feeders. <laughs> There's a lot of cat feeders. <laughs> like Plant really waterers, yeah. things like that. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> it's the cats. Yeah. It's the cats. That's, that's where you start, and then you build from there to right. create your thing. You don't start off by building Juicero, and most people don't end up building Juicero either. It's too soon. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but like, yeah. so yeah, it's like it's like you're using these technologies. You build a prototype, and then once you once you <laughs> want to go to the next stage, then you have to sort of pull in this ecosystem, and that's where it starts to look different from the two software engineers building the mm -hmm. the um, the startup. Is is that like you have to find a contract manufacturer? You have to figure out how to deal with logistics. Like, how do I actually get these physical assets from this manufacturer in Shenzhen? to the third-party logistics uh, company in Gilroy, and how do they get through customs, and what like regulations do I have to deal with with shipping batteries and like all of this oh, yeah. stuff, which you really need to pull in a bunch of people to help you with, because it, it's not possible for two people to, to manage all those, all those problems. And I'll say from just a, a revenue yeah. side of things, hearing what Zach says, I'd be remiss if I didn't see this from the other side, which is who's actually demanding this, right? So these problems that Zach are, is talking through are really, really relevant if you found people to buy the product. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's where, from a hardware standpoint, the testing cycle is so much longer than with software. If you're designing an app where you can iterate every week and you can find new revenue streams very quickly and spend other people's money very quickly but very efficiently, hardware is far less efficient and far slower, right? So that's the steps in place um, will always be a little bit different. What we push on teams is usually to start with um, market validation in the terms mm -hmm. of a crowdfunding campaign, mm -hmm. um, just to see if there's product market fit. Do people want this? Does it fill a white space? Will they pay money to wait for a year to get it? Yes. If they will, that's usually a pretty good sign. And then can yes. they make it faster than their competition? Um, from a B2B standpoint, can the team get a pilot? Can they, uh, can they act on it very quickly? Um, can they be good salespeople? Um, and if they can, that might be a really good sign that it's time to keep going and see what's next and iterate as the product sells. Um, but it typically takes the things that Zach just talked through, it might take a team four years to get mm -hmm. to that point or three years. And that wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't be an extraordinarily long amount of time. That would be average. And that takes a lot of capital, right? So I always tell people, if you are having conversations with potential consumers about your product and they're obsessed with it and they love it and they tell their friends, take that as a good sign. Take the first step. And then whenever you have your proof of concept, talk to those same people, talk to new people, get their feedback and keep going. So every step of the way, you're keeping that potential buyer in mind because they are the people who will enable you to get to the point where you're worried about who's going to pick this up in Paramus, <laughs> New Jersey, once it actually <laughs> ships, or what happens next. Uh, Absolutely. No, go ahead, Ella. Uh, sure. You mentioned testing, and I've noticed that like testing and security are both things that people tend to think of as luxuries that you'll, uh, you know, you'll get to <laughs> after you've got your product. And it really needs to be woven in from the start, and that's yeah. where going through something like an accelerator can really help, because mm -hmm. people have this experience, and they know like what's going to kick you in the ass like 10 years, or not, well, one year down the line, <laughs> 10 weeks down the Hopefully line. Hopefully not 10 know. years, but we've <laughs> seen it. <laughs> <laughs> should know by then. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. So Apple started as a DIY home brewing computer club, right? So there's like enough stories out there, DIY movement, how that took a kit or a thing that was to be tested by market first, right? To be validated, to be understood there's a real need before it could become this great product that everyone can't live without now. So which is the, the power of this moment. Now let's talk a little bit about the community aspect as we are talking about the great community of sharing and makers coming and fueling this moment. And I share you have built in mm -hmm. so many communities. Mm -hmm. Before maker community, you build a whole O'Reilly and Java community. Mm -hmm. Java one. Java one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tell us a little bit more about the value of community and how we bring it together as we... Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about communities is, and what we found is that, like, the robot group just talks to the robot group, and the rocket group <laughs> just talks to the rocket group. <laughs> the magic, and this is where Maker Faire comes into play, as is with online communities, is that they come together, and then there's this mashup of great ideas. Yeah. So communities are really important. And again, it almost doesn't matter what the community is, yep. but giving communities a chance to share and showcase what they do. And we've even found this going into towns because everyone thinks they know everyone. Oh yeah, we know that person and that person. <laughs> but the, by, by being able to collaborate, and this is where I think Maker Faire is great, because mm -hmm. then people start working together. I know when we were in Austin, there was the, some of the folks from like the Dorkbot group that then got to meet the folks from the Children's Museum. And all of a sudden they had a venue to do certain, you know, Tesla coil shows. And even at Maker Faire, I have to say this last weekend, there's, we have something called Rock the Bike, which is a pedal power stage. Teaches you about, you know, everything from electricity to generating it, and people get on the bikes to, to pedal to generate the electricity for the band. Right behind them was the giant Tesla coils. Well, next year, these two t are talking, and they're gonna see if they can actually have Rock the Bike generate electricity for the Tesla, Tesla coils. Coil. <laughs> that's that's the brilliance of, of community, and that that's, what happens in a very accelerated fashion in this world. Absolutely, no. so we have built the community through, uh, for my son, as Sherry was mm -hmm. indicating earlier, he's a 10 year old, and we have made friends over the last four years at Make a Fair that will stay friends for life. Uh, similarly, as you talk about like people b putting their projects around, you build a community when you put your projects on a site like Hackster, mm -hmm. and really they are followers, people who would love to see more coming out of it. So any thoughts, Alex, from that perspective, how you build communities online and drive sure. that? Well, we're sort of, um, 
a child of this open source movement because by putting your project online and sharing the files and things, you are making it open source. We have like nine or 13 licenses on there that you can choose from, but it's all open source. And uh, like you've said in the past, uh, like being open source was a very conscious decision that Particle made mm -hmm. um, as a way to, uh, for one thing, appeal to Kickstarter backers because it m gives people the warm fuzzies if they know that there's a, it makes it into people, right? It's not just yeah. a product, it's you're supporting yeah. people. Uh, and that's what open source is really about, that we sort of grew out of. Um, you know, so the reason that Raspberry Pi and Arduino uh, and even BeagleBone have gotten so popular is in part, like, the reason new people should go to those platforms is because they have massive communities sharing stuff about them already. Uh, and, yeah, the more that you can keep people in the community, and keep the um, the atmosphere welcoming for new ones. Uh, there's a lot of sort of destroying this idea of elitism. Uh, we do everything we can to uh, make sure that we have a code of conduct that encourages people to welcome new people in instead of being like, well, you don't know anything. What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, that's a very, that's like a core thing in the maker movement is like, well, yeah, I don't know how to do it. That's why I'm here. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, um, and that's what the community is about, is like yes. helping the people go yes. from nothing to where they can what be they building mm. particle, yeah. So as people are uh, seeing all these cool projects and you're seeing the new hardware that comes in, now there's always new cool stuff coming out to market. There's always this question like, what's that next innovative hardware because I know there are a lot of you software developers who are integrating a lot of hardware in your project. Is like, what's your thought on what's the next new innovative hardware on IoT side we can think about or see? So you know, I think I think one of the great one of the simplest ways to think about the hardware ecosystem is like uh, we are we are we are experiencing Moore's law mm. very, uh, and it is it is opening up things in in the PC world. I think like. You saw what happened with Moore's Law and the 286 followed by the 386 and the 46 and like how it changed how people interacted with computers because you could do so much more. And we're now at the point with PCs where it's sort of diminishing returns. Like mm. I, I, I just recently replaced my five-year-old laptop with a new one and I was like, it works kind of the same. It's, it's not <laughs> that different. It's a little thinner, yeah. but it's, it, it, we're sort of you know, diminishing returns. Whereas if you then move into the embedded world, the 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 pace of Moore's Law and technologies that are unaffordable that become affordable one year later is really interesting. So what I look at is like right now, BLE, like a lot of IoT devices and wearables are BLE and the reason for that comes down to the fact that we have it in our phones and it's cheap. Um, BLE chips are really inexpensive. Um, and there's sort of BLE and then there's Wi-Fi and then there's uh, cellular and then there's satellite and there's like these layers where you might look and like, I'm not going to have a satellite connected thing because that's too expensive. It costs like tens of dollars per month to have to get like bytes of data via Iridium satellite. But we're, see, we're experiencing all of the cost structure come down, the power budget comes down, you can put them into, which means you get smaller form factors, smaller batteries, they can last for longer. Um, and uh, and the, the cost of connectivity for cellular plans, for, for satellite connectivity, um, the cost of the routers and the gateways is all coming down. And so as a result, every year there are you know, two or three times as many viable IoT products than there were the year before because, because of the, this changing the, the changes that are happening on the technology side. And so we just see the market is growing and growing and growing. Um, Things that are a bad idea today because they're not economically viable become a good idea tomorrow once the economics actually makes sense. Any thoughts, uh, Kate, from your side, what you're seeing in attacks? Yeah, we've seen a lot of the, some of the same trends that you were mentioning where we'll get um, a huge swath of applications around uh, uh, electric skateboards or electric bikes or um, sleep monitors, baby monitors. Um, anything in the kitchen that can affect a knob that you mm -hmm. can tinker with on an app. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we see these kind of trends coming, but those aren't necessarily the ones that we'll be surprised by or the ones that yeah. we'll invest in in the future. Yeah. So it's almost hard to say what we think will be the next exciting thing. I'll say that we are doubling down on health teams right now. Mm -hmm. So it's teams with hec uh, technology that's somehow related to tracking your health and the information that that can be used for, which is many, many things. 
Um, but that could take just about any form, right? From a consumer application to a medical application, which is a very different process for a team to go through. Um, so health, for sure, obviously, um, the future will, of course, be in many ways in AI, which will go back to hardware. There has yes. to be hardware involved in that somehow. Involved. So we, we like all the ways that we're seeing that develop, but of course, the next five years and all the laws that go along with that <laughs> will dictate what comes up as a really relevant product. I know a lot of people think that um, uh, kind of all the things that VR are bringing will be the next big bubble, but I, you know, what, what exactly will that mean for everyday consumers? It's hard to say at the exact moment, despite the amount of dollars that have gone that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, if I had a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think, we don't really we all wish to have a crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> since we don't have a crystal ball, let's very quickly, maybe in the last couple of minutes, rapid fire, like what's one thing each of you will Ooh. tell all the great makers and hobbyists, and is it healthcare, maybe something else? One advice for folks to work on, or if they're tinkering, what it means for their career and for their development. So, Kate, do you want to start? I, c I can start. I always yeah. tell people um, from a product standpoint, if it seems like a good idea to you, it probably is, because we're all consumers, right? Every single one of us, buy products, we use products, we're able to decide if something seems like it's a reasonable idea. Hardware is very democratic in that way. So if something seems great to you and it seems great to other people, it's probably an idea that you should act on. If it seems fishy, it probably <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Oh, let's see. Um, there's this great thing that someone said a while ago that was one prototype is worth a thousand designs and that mm -hmm. is 100% true. Uh, you know. Even if you don't think it's going to work halfway, just build it. Just build it, iterate as fast as you can. There's all these tools nowadays. There's 3D printers, there's um, you know, CAD, CAM, uh, a bajillion tools out there. And each of these has you know, so many options. Um, there's no excuse that you shouldn't be able to build something now. There's remote printing options and stuff. And you can get people to contract online to help you design things. Upverter has built in human help for designing PCBs. Uh, this stuff is out there. So just get building it. And then you'll know so much faster just having something in your hands than going over and over on whiteboards and paper and stuff. Just start building it, yeah. Start building. Zach? So I think uh, one of the things I'm seeing is unsexy is the new sexy. So like a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the, good, the best products are not, mm -hmm. they're not consumer appliances. <laughs> they're not things that any one of us would buy. They're like methane, like methane sensors on natural gas rigs, right? It's like, oh. that's a great business. Uh, turns out methane's super bad for the environment, but like, but natural gas is, mm. uh, you know, is clean, relatively speaking. So we want we want to get natural gas, but no methane. Mm. That's a solvable problem, and it involves sensors, and it involves collecting information, and like that's a great product. And those cases are in many in in many cases those products are better and better businesses than the you know the connected hairbrush. They're making <laughs> gas more sexy, methane more sexy. Yeah. So one of those. So <laughs> let's look at that. <laughs> Sherry, one last. No, one. yeah. Let me just say that I think each one of you, if you haven't started making, start thinking about it, and failure's okay. Failure's an important <laughs> part. I think we're talking about iteration and that. But get involved, and if it's not for you, it's for someone else. I mean, this is about the future, and each one of you can affect somebody's life. And that's what I'll say the great thing about Maker Faire is um, we're turning these kids on to things, and I'll just say we've got one decade of kids that are now, like, they care about the environment, they care about resources, they care about making and collaboration. These are all good human values and traits. So I encourage you to go out there and make, and you know, Dale coined it, we're all makers. Just do it. There you have it. So we all are makers, so go ahead and make stuff. <laughs> With that, <laughs> thank you to all our guests yeah. today. Thank, thank you. you so much, Kerry, Zach. <laughs> and with that, don't leave yet. We have good stuff coming back. So I will have Mandy come back on stage with. Okay. Cool. Great. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Shiva. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that was a great panel. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. That was fantastic. All right, so we are almost to the very end of the day. Um, two things that we want to do before we head out for our happy hour and, and social hour is we want to spend some time uh, carrying on a tradition that a lot of us have participated in in the DevOps Days series of conferences. Who's been to a DevOps Days? Anybody? 
All right. So a lot of um, and a lot of the DevOps Days is a series of conferences that happens all over the globe, actually. And one of the things that they do is at the end they invite people from the conference to come up and share something that they've learned, a takeaway, a new thought, something that they came across during the conference. And it helps the community kind of come together. You may hear something that someone else learned that was in a session you didn't go to that you want to know more about, and you can connect with them. And so we wanted to carry that on. Uh, today, so we're going to open this up. We're going to have people come up, and if you if you learned something or have it have a big takeaway you'd like to share, you can come up and share it. You get one of our awesome um, API shirts that you could win in the bingo contest. If you haven't won one of those and you want one, this is your chance. Come do it. <laughs> um, so we're going to do a little bit of that, and then we've got our raffle for the Spark telepresence gear and for the Jasper IoT kits. So we're also going to do the the raffle. So. Do you want to add anything? Nope. Let's right. start the feedback. Anybody want to come share something? You don't have to come up on stage. You can come just in front, or we can even bring you the mic if you want. You got something? OK. I just want to share something really quick. So there are a bunch of technologies out there. And I, it's, it's very easy to um, you know, get uh, familiarized yourself with all those very quickly. I think I've, that's something I learned, and something about PubNub. You can uh, uh, you can create and how I can use it with the Google Cloud or um, some uh, variety of technologies that I can basically use without without much of a cost. I think that's, some, that's something I. That's great. Thank great. You. Thank you. And you can grab a shirt. We've got different sizes here if you want. Anyone else? Anyone else? You want? Yeah. Uh, I was really, I guess, impressed and surprised by the hacker, uh, the Cisco one that you could put together your own IoT device with the water sensor, as well as there was a great uh, IBM loopback presentation for putting together an API really quickly. Oh, fantastic. So, so you, did the, um, you did the water sensor mini hack, yeah? And did you get it to work? You could tell when it you can go detected it? Awesome. Fantastic. All right, who else? Anyone else? It's really bright. It's hard to see. There Raise your hand big side, and tall. Over here. All right. To your left. Paul. Over here. He had one. Too. Yeah, there we go. Uh, for me, it was uh, about um, the comment that Todd Nightingale held that it's important to be in this first definite create. And it's an event that I believe it's going to be very important for CISCO in the next years. So um, for the audience, it's uh, something to remember that you've been here in the first event because in the next probably the five years, it's going to be very complicated to get a ticket <laughs> in this huge <laughs> new event. So that. Awesome. That's great. All right. Anyone else? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so what I saw in this conference was uh, that it's like a plethora of uh, talks and plethora of topics which are here, like cloud meets the apps, uh, IoT meets apps. So I think there's something for everyone. And uh, th this is something which is lacking. in. A lot of conference they specialize into like uh, maybe just Golang or maybe just one kind of thing. But this is something I feel it's mix of uh, all the technologies, and that is very important these days because almost everyone is working on a bunch of technologies, and no one is. There are very few people who would be just specializing to one thing. I think uh, so. That's what I really liked. That's a great point, and that's something that we kind of planned as we were bringing together the conference together. So, uh, Is the mix of IoT and cloud, does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Point. All right, anyone else? Yeah, uh, OK. Yeah, I think uh, that's what it, it's, I think it's the blend of uh, IoT and the cloud, and as well as the hackathons that you have put. Like, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good experience. Like, uh, and for sure, like, uh, I'm going to take to for my team the ones that I have learned on CNCF, and also the ecosystem in the cloud, uh, I think that's a really good one. Yeah. Fantastic. OK, let's do two more, and then we'll do the raffle. Who wants to be our last two to share? There's. Where? Raise your hand. Raise. Oh. Back there, Jock. OK. Oh, they can get, you guys can get Hello. your t-shirts afterwards. Why don't you come up front and grab them after? I don't need a t-shirt, though. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> Jock? So one of the best parts of the conference so far for me has been basically sharing information between all the people I've gotten to talk to. So people have shared new things that I haven't heard, and I've shared things that I'm doing that I'm working on, like with 
IoT or DevOps or anything like that. And that's been really super valuable for me. Even though I'm one of the people that's helped put it on, it's I'm getting a lot out of it too. So that's really good. That's good to hear. All right. Okay. Cool. Last one. Who wants the last comment? All right. We have a winner over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hands up again. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I, I come from a very traditional Cisco hardware networking background. So for me, this was an eye opener. And, and especially I work for a bank and there's a lot of emphasis on things like automation, cost reduction, and all of those things are driving towards you know, coding. So uh, this was really useful and an eye opener for us. And I'm really happy to see that Cisco is embracing software, <laughs> which is because traditionally we look at, look, look at Cisco as a hardware company, but yeah, that's a game changer for us. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you to everyone who, who gave the feedback and shared. And please feel free to keep that conversation going with each other and all of our DevNet team members. We're going to do the same thing tomorrow at the end of the day when we do our raffle. So we're ready for our raffle. Um, do you want me to, we're, we're going to do this in an interactive way, and we're actually going to use API calls <laughs> to do the raffle. So of course, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, all right. So and we're that, And this is interesting. So when did the idea come? So we're trying to figure out how to do prizes and how to give away prizes. Um, so in figuring out how to give prizes, we put our own team to the test, and they've hacked out a little system. They started at 4 o'clock today? Two hours. So this was so a, a uh, mini hack within our team. <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Okay, so get your smartphones out. We've been talking about smartphones and all the devices we have on us today. So get your smartphone out, and we're going to put up a URL. It is HTTPS, and you have to have the HTTPS because we're Cisco and we're secure. And you have to have um, raffle.devnetcreate.io. So just a second, and we'll make that visible to you. So it's raffle.devnetcreate.io. And you should have a screen come up. Yes. So here you go. Here's the URL that you're going to. And when you get to that button, you get to that screen, click Get Started. And then it's going to ask you to log into DevNet so we know who you are. And then you can enter a number. You will enter a number. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a random number gener generator, pick a random number, and the six people that are closest to that number will win the raffle prizes. This is all going to be in real time as we do it. So um, yeah, so we're going to see how that comes up, right? So, so OK, everybody get, get to the page. Number between 1 and 50. Number between 1 and 50. OK, let us know. Like, yes. Give me some eye contact when you've got it, when you've entered your number. All right, good, good, good. You want me to? In. All right, all right. Are you in? If you're not in, no prize. All right, so we're going to see in? people's numbers coming up here. And if you're hanging out on this page, you can scroll below and see some of our DevNet resources as well. All right, how's it going? Who? Um, doesn't have their number in yet. OK, OK, keep going, keep going. <laughs> if you're here, you should, you should get your number in. Yes. Do you need, you the, the, strong do they need the URL again? It's HTTPS raffle.devnetcreate.io. Then you can log in with any of your social accounts or your Cisco ID or your Spark ID. And then once you're there, get started and enter your number. All right, let's see. Who, who's, who is still entering their number? OK, a couple. All right, a few more minutes. Five. All right, we're getting a lot of numbers in there. <laughs> All right, everybody got their number in? Nope, nope. OK, 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 OK. The suspense is building. It's like <laughs> we could also do some machine learning on like what's the most popular number. and. How does that come together? And by the way, once you get in, you're a DevNet member. So you just registered for DevNet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everybody got their number in? Still waiting? Do we I'm need to wait? Count. Yeah. All done? Done? Got it? Got done? It? Uh, OK. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> 
Okay, between one and, and 50. 50. Yeah. Um, <laughs> someone didn't Go. read the docs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, are we good? Got it? Okay, okay, I think we're ready. Right. Let's do it. Let's. What are we giving away first? For the person who gets the closest number will get the Spark Telepresence gear, and then the next five will get the Jasper IoT kits, which is what we use to do the water sensor hack, mini hack, but you'll get to take one home to play with. All right, ready, let's do it. 14. Okay, who are our six closest? So this is like real time, on the fly, hack. Oh, okay. Wissom. Woo! <laughs> right! <laughs> Woo! <You win. laughs> Your HD video telepresence. Yeah, well, we can help you out with that if we need to. So, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> so that is the gear that Jason Gecki showed this morning. And uh, have fun. All right, then we've got five Jasper kits. Um, oh, we're going to do another number. Oh, OK, OK. 39. 39. All right, the next number. Who is that going to be? Oh, uh. nobody. 45. <laughs> they have to be equal? Wow. OK, it's hardcore. OK. So we've got two winners of the Jasper kits. Are you here? Stand up, because you have to be here to win. You have to still be in the room. All right, one and two. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, <laughs> the Jasper kits. <laughs> Come, come see me after, yes. and we will get you your Jasper can, kits. You can come over here. Yeah, oh, you can stay there. You can, you can stay, stay there. there. But just at the end, come over here. OK, so we have three more kits to give out. Three. Three. All right. Ooh. Oh, and nice. we're done. All right, are all these people here? Do you recognize Oh, and yourself? we have some students here from Holberton. Fantastic. OK, stand up. If Where's you won. All right, one. Excellent. One. Excellent. Excellent. Two. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. sorry. One of them is our team member. So, no, you're good. You're good. You may come over. <laughs> okay, so we need one okay, more. Okay, we get to do another. Okay, one more. <coughs> 47. I wish we would get 42 since it's the answer to the universe. <laughs> right now. Okay. All right, do we have this winner? Our last winner, is he here? Oh, that's you? Oh, oh no, no, he's no, on no. our team. Oh, <laughs> we were doing some testing beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, Jose. Jose, <laughs> all right, Jose. <laughs> all right, okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, we've got happy hour, social, out in the the lobby. <laughs> Big round for our winners. That's it. You want to Great. Say Thank you. Have Thank a great you. DevNet Create. Go to happy hour, everybody. See you over there. <laughs>